What's up, everybody? Last day of the con. Now, before UA High and My Hero Academia, there was Beacon High and Ruby. So we got Ruby fans here. Welcome to the world of Remnant, and welcome back to the Sci-Fi Wire live stage. I'm Karima, AKA The Blurred Girl, and I am here with voice actors, Lindsay Jones, who plays Ruby Rose. Hello. Barbara Dunkelman, who plays Ruby's sister, Yang Zhao Long. Also from Rooster Teeth, Miles Luna, writer and voice of Jean Arc. <laughs> Carrie Shawcross, co writer and co director, and Rooster Teeth, co director and the voice of Roman Torchwick himself. <laughs> Gray Haddock. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for having us. Hello, thank so you. We, we got a lot to talk about. We got 30 minutes to break this down. We're going to talk about both Ruby and Genlock. You guys heard about Genlock, right? So, first, uh, I need to know what's happening with Adam. What is going on? <laughs> that's a good well, question for the me. writers, yes. That's, uh, <laughs> what is you know. happening? Tell us everything that's happening in Volume 6. Okay, so here's everything that's happening in Volume 6. You have to watch it. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun uh, putting out, um, we did one character short this season, in the yeah. past we did more, but this season we're like, let's just do one, we'll make it look really, really cool, and then we'll be able to focus a whole bunch of other time and energy on the show. And uh, the one that we decided to do this year was on Adam, who's uh, not the best dude ever. Um, yeah, let's say he's not Some great. would say he's the worst. Um, I know I'm not a fan of him. That's what I'm saying. He did chop her arm off, so... Yeah, he's not a good dude. Um, but, but you we do wanted... realize that... I, I feel like you guys have done a really good job at showing that White Fang isn't all bad. Like, there's a yeah. method to it, their madness. It started from a very pure place and kind of morphed Spun out of control. over time. Yeah. And unfortunately, some, some bad, power-hungry people got into the wrong positions and, and things have kind of gone south and we're going to see we what don't know anything about that in real life yeah no it's yeah. definitely not oh. a documentary about that you know um but uh uh yeah no we're going to be when we when we start off uh, ruby volume six we might be seeing what some of the repercussions of uh the end of volume five in regards to some yeah. of the choices that adam made kind of what's going to happen from that things didn't go well for him and because of that things did not go for the white fang so you know are are there some tensions there we'll see there's some issues we'll see now, there might be maybe, I don't know, two people here who don't know what Ruby is. Can you real quick, uh, any of you, real quick, do a 30-second recap as to what this show, right, that's the challenge. We're going to time you, too. Time do you, you. want to do it? So I was going to okay. go to Gray. Okay, yeah, you got who wants this. To do it? Put it on Gray. For the two people here watching that don't know what Ruby is, uh, you want to share that? Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm just terrible at summaries, though. It's my problem. So, uh, I'll make him do it. Ruby is a show about kids that are trained to fight these horrible monsters called the Creatures of Grimm on a planet called Remnant. And they go to these academies, Beacon and Haven and Shade and Atlas. Archery and, Vikings. And uh, 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 essentially, uh, the first few volumes of the show take place at Beacon Academy, where we're learning about our four main characters, uh, Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang, coming together to form Team Ruby. And then some stuff happens. Happens, and then they don't go to that school anymore, and I'm not gonna 100% just say why. Maybe you could watch it if you want to. Uh, now we're in a, 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 a part of the story where they're going on a journey around the world to collect some certain things before some bad people collect those things, and uh, it's really cool. And there's lots of fights, and sometimes it's funny, and we hope you like it. And that's then that's Ruby. To sum it up, I guess he it's did a bit pretty like good. He Harry did, Potter just over meets Magical seconds. Girl meets video games. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And the weapons are amazing. Yeah. Yes. My favorite thing at conventions these days is to see a giant sniper scythe just like yeah. wading through the audience. Yeah, That's you, always a favorite. You can spot a Ruby cosplayer from like 20 miles away. <laughs> is it, you know what, let's talk about the fans a little bit because this is really a fan-based show as opposed to like a, and I'm not saying that you're not network quality, but when I first heard about Ruby, I was looking at Rooster Teeth and looking at YouTube and then I know Crunchyroll kind of started simulcasting and stuff like that. But I've always heard about Ruby through other friends and fans. What's been some of the craziest fan stuff that you guys have had to deal with? I think now breaking into an international fan base is the biggest thing for me, especially as an anime fan. I mean, we're being dubbed in Japan right now through Warner Brothers Japan. So to have people from, from Japan, the, the, the birthplace of anime messaging us and saying, hey, we love Ruby, it's fantastic. It really feels like we now are part of this incredible story and this lineage behind this genre. 
Yeah, I think, I think one of the coolest moments and kind of like very surreal moments for me was Lindsay and I were at a convention a couple years ago when Ruby was kind of just starting to take off. And not a lot of people knew we were going to be there, but we had a booth that we were signing at. And Stan Lee was at the booth next to us. And our line was longer than Stan Lee's. And Lindsay and I, we looked at each other and we're like, what is this world? Oh my god. <laughs> so our, our fans have just been so enthusiastic and so incredible ever since Ruby even started, even before Ruby started, just when we were putting out teasers, they were just already on the hype train. Oh yeah, when I first, when I first saw my very first Ruby Rose trailer, it was like, who's Red Riding Hood with the weapons? Like, what's happening? Well, I like, think that was one of the craziest things too, is by the time, once that came out, we were seeing fan art and cosplay before the actual show was out. And that was such like a crazy thing to us. And it was, uh, it was very motivating at the beginning, especially when, you know, times were a little tougher and we were, we were having to like really, you know, pour everything into getting this thing out. To know that people were already excited for it uh, helped a lot, yeah. From the, from the cosplay to the art and the photography, and we've got people now that are making their own live action shorts. It's just the, the amount of love and support that everybody's been showing the, showing the property has just been really heartwarming and motivating. It's been great. I, I, I love all the OCs. Like, I just think that's really cool. Like, you know, Harry Potter, you always, like, there's tests. It's like, ooh, my Gryffindor is Slytherin. And like, <laughs> now it's like, yo, which, like, school would you go to? And like, oh, what's my character's semblance is this? And oh, they're a Faunus, and they have this trait. And like, it's really cool seeing um, other people having a lot of fun with this world that we kind of threw together and, and, and making it their own. Yeah, especially when, like, friend groups make teams together. Dude, and yes! Stuff. Yeah. I think and one I of my most favorite fan interactions these days, this has got to be the, uh, <laughs> has, has got to be um, all the people that uh, come and meet us at the conventions and then tell us that it was something about uh, Rooster Teeth in general or uh, Ruby or the other animated productions that got them into production or animation. It's, it's the, yeah, because if, if we can do it, anybody can do it. But, you know, the, the Rooster Teeth is in its 15th year now and it was created by, yeah. But, you know, it was uh, Matt and Bernie and the gang got started uh, in the back of Bernie's apartment cracking jokes over Halo video game footage, and that became this little thing called Red vs. Blue. And, I mean, the, the company was founded by a bunch of fans wanting to show their love for uh, other things out there in the world, and now we're making our own cartoons, and it's kind of crazy. And you know what, I, and I also just think in terms of progression, where your characters have gone, the animation style. Do you ever look at some of the first renders of Ruby and then look at volume six and go, wow. Do you ever do that? <laughs> oh yeah, I know Barbara and I, and some of the other voice actors as well were like, we would like to go re-record volume yeah. one, please, and thank you. I think but it's great. Gray mentioned it, and he does have a good point, is he said this, even though we look back and say, okay, we could have fixed something here, we could have changed something there, it led to where we are now. So really, we can't complain at all about the history that we've had with Ruby. Yeah, if we go back and, and change anything that I, I don't know that we would have found the particular path that we did, you know, uh, there's always going to be something that you wish you could have done better. Even while you're in the middle of making the thing or just trying to finish and get out the door, you know that you wanted to have more time or resources to do the thing. And uh, art's got to meet commerce somewhere. But... Uh, I think we've all made peace with it because each each volume is a love letter to who we were as a crew at the time and what we knew and uh, you know every year we just try to get better and then that's all you can do really. Can you each name a favorite scene? And it doesn't have to be an action scene. And I know the voiceover talent's gonna have a different. Yeah, I, I have a I have a few favorite scenes for different reasons. My favorite fight scene is volume one, episode eight. Um, when they're in the forest with the Nevermore. I think that is the coolest thing ever. Um, yeah, I, some people agree. Uh, but my new favorite scene is actually the confrontation between Yang and her mother uh, at the end of Volume 5. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think that was one of the best fight scenes that didn't have any actual physical fighting. So, yeah. <laughs> He's worst mom. Yeah. Yes. Worst mom. <laughs> your, your family is... Y'all have issues. It's, it's interesting. It's yeah. We're starting our own reality show very soon. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Makeup line. Yeah, the roses. Um, <laughs> but for me, I agree completely with volume one, episode eight fight scene, especially because that was the first time for a lot of us that the show resonated with us. And we went, wow, this is really going to be something big. This is incredible. Uh, as far as an actor goes, from my acting perspective, 
I love the end of Volume 3 because that's the first time that Ruby as a character really experiences a lot of deeper issues. And we took her to an emotional level she'd never been to before, especially in a scene between her and Yang, which definitely made me cry in the booth a little bit. Me too. <laughs> Aww. Um, it was really fun getting to record Jean just like, just shouting at Cinder. Uh, I think the, the little string bean boy had that like pent up for a really long time and getting all that out was really cathartic. So that was, that was a really fun scene to record. Um, I think one of my favorite things to at least work on was the, uh, the Crow Tyrion fight uh, in volume four. It was just, it was a lot of fun and it was a lot of uh, trying, to, trying out new things and you know, really just having fun with a fight and like just going for it. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's a testament to everyone's work that to this day, uh, without getting too spoilery about it, there's an episode late volume three called PVP where things get kind of real and the plan that Sinner's been working on for two and a half years finally comes to fruition and, you know, the alarms start to go off and things start to happen and it's kind of like this this three-year journey to the top of the roller coaster finally hits its peak, and here we go. Welcome to the rest of the saga, everybody. And I mean, to this day, I still choke up when all that begins to happen. So. Now, what's the one thing, since you guys can't tell us anything about volume six? I tried backstage, guys. I tried. <laughs> what, what is one thing that you want everybody to know? Like, every, does everybody in the stage right now live? <laughs> yeah. Do we all live? I mean, as well, long, as long as you don't fall already off the stage. Gone. <laughs> uh oh. Here, no, I mean in volume six. Start going into volume six. Yeah. Going into volume six, some I guess some stuff that we could talk about is um, it comes you know, after volume five. It does. <laughs> this is what they were <laughs> doing me before. I'm like, and this is just a rumor, but before volume seven, I think I think it's going <laughs> to be a in the middle choice. there. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we were able to spend a lot of time uh, this year um, really taking a lot of time to try and, like, bump up our writing schedule, which did mean, like, one week after Ruby 5 ended, we got started on Ruby 6. But because of that, um, we were able to do, like, um, uh, give ourselves a little more time and, and went back and looked at stuff from last volume and previous volumes, like, hey, what are things that we thought went really well? What are things that we thought could have gone a lot better? And like, really try to focus on what we can do to make volume six as best as it can be. And I think one of the things that we're definitely doing is uh, we wanted to make sure that there was always this sense of constantly moving forward, which means new places, new people, new monsters, new things, almost every episode and not not just being in like one house for a long time. Um, so yeah, we really wanted this volume to have this like awesome journey feel. And um, not so much like in volume four, we were like jumping between a bunch of different storylines, but to be with one group on this like crazy roller coaster across a continent, uh, I think it's gonna be really exciting. From an actress perspective, it sounds cliche to say, but I think it's true, is just expect the unexpected. There were many times in the booth where I was reading the script and what was happening would make sense narratively, but I never expected it to happen in those moments. So I think you're gonna be blown away by what you see. Yeah, there, something I also really enjoyed about this volume was there's some new themes that we get to play with that haven't been done in Ruby before. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything, but I'm. I think people are really gonna. He's like it. staring holes in the back of her head. Like, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Okay, safer ground. We're gonna move forward into Genlock real quick. Ooh. And yeah, now they're like, yes, we can talk about this. <laughs> so Genlock, for those of you who don't know, is a new show by Rooster Teeth that's dropping January 2019, created by this team here, and it's gonna be starring Michael B. Jordan, Dakota Fanning. Kuishi Yamadera, Muika Rial, David Tennant, Maisie Williams, Lindsay Jones, Gray Haddock, you just, you get all the checks, Miles Luna, you do too, Blaine Gibson, and Chad James. So what is the premise, Gray? Uh, the premise is, uh, Jinlock is, you know, think of it as a, as a summer sci-fi action movie that just happens to be animated. It is set on our Earth, 50 years in the future, and uh, war has broken out, and it happens to involve giant robots. So, hmm. Yeah, if Do you guys want to see a trailer? Yeah. I'm not convinced. They're very quiet over here. Do you guys want to see a trailer? Yeah. Yes, please. All I right, would like to see that. <laughs> okay, now, guys in the tech room, don't embarrass me. Play the trailer. <laughs>
Doctor, it galls me to say this, but I'm impressed. Your recruit Madrani exceeds my expectations. Yes, she and Chase work together rather well. They've been good for one another, given each of their recent histories. Your new armor sets, however. What's the problem? They're rather utilitarian. The engineers I provided were from the very same team that designed our striders. Yes, I can tell. I'm going to protect my investment. Move on, Doctor. Fine, fine, fine. Speaking of not wanting to ignore terrific potential, I have our next two candidates identified. Uh, we have here an industrious young tech whiz and a highly spirited former tank driver. A hacker and a cook? Yeah, semantics. My contacts at CyberOps say Miss McLeod is one of the most creative coders they've ever met. Hmm? That sort of mental flexibility will come in handy with us. As for Ida-san, his unit is very supportive to transfer him. That's because he was busted down to KP for insubordination. They're probably happy to be rid of him. Now, now, beggars, choosers, may I request their transfer? No, we can do better than this. Each of these recruits is one in a million. If you could improve Genlock compatibility, we wouldn't have to rely on such sorry candidates. Keep looking. Someone woke up on the wrong side of the wall this morning. Okay, so Max. Yeah. Yay. Y'all know how I feel about equipment. <laughs> Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> so what you're watching right there was the uh, third out of four planned character introduction teasers that we've been doing. Uh, if you poke around online, you can find one through three. Each one introduces one to two of the main cast and starts to show you a little bit more of the technology that's in the show. And uh, they are actually, they're in canon. So once you watch the show, you can go back and look at these teasers again and go, oh, it was like it happened right here in the story. There, there's a little mini story across these little four teasers that people will be rewarded with if you watch the whole thing. You guys are really good at that. I remember each season of, of Ruby, I remember seeing teasers, and then you could kind of slot them into where they were going. That's, you guys are very good at promoting your, your stuff. Now, tell us a, uh, like the baddies a little bit, because I've heard it's sort of cultural warfare, something like that. Yeah, it's kind of evolved over time. The, uh, I pitched it coming up on two and a half years ago. And uh, at the time, that was before the most recent American presidential campaign and the election and a couple of years after that. And, so you uh, didn't pattern it after that. It just happened to happen in real life. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, a, a lot of the things, a lot of the themes that we want to imbue the show with uh, were originally intended to be kind of a cautionary tale and speculative fiction. And now it's kind of passed into world history. So uh, what we've decided to do is uh, the first season is going to now focus on uh, the themes of during tough times, you know, uh, what sort of qualities do you need to get through those tough times and endure and still make a positive change around you with whatever it is you happen to have access to. So uh, I think we're going to talk a lot about that this year. And, uh, you know, if we're fortunate enough to have a second season, knock on wood, then we'll begin to explore some of the details about how the other factions work. And how big is the team? Again? How big is the team? Oh, the team, uh, there are six people on the team that are identified as being compatible with the Genlock technology. So uh, we're going to go ahead and assemble the team and see if slash how they learn to master this cool new tech that allows them to pilot the robots. But, but the, each of these mechs are run by, like, individuals. We're not talking about drift compatibility or anything no, like no, that. No, 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 no. It is a single checking. pilot system. Now, m the most important question that I have is, how did you get Michael B. Jordan involved, and why isn't he here? <laughs> well, funny you should ask. Hey, Mike, come on. No, sorry. Don't tease. That's such that. a mean oh, thing no. to do. Stop it. I, I only get to do that. He did that. I did not plan that. That's How dare mean. You. Yeah, but what if it worked, guys? What if it worked? <laughs> if, we, if we all <laughs> just like Beetlejuice. Like, really exactly. Michael, 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 Michael. Makes you feel any better? When I was backstage a moment ago, I was in the green room with Barbara, and I physically ran into David Tennant, and I was like, "Hey, you want to come to our panel?" <laughs> I know. I, we've seen him around the. I'm like, are, are you coming to sci-fi, please? <laughs> no, and it's me, David Tennant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's been great. So, I mean, the thing about it is, is that the, the ensemble uh, is actually really supportive and interested in making appearances and getting to interact with the Rooster Teeth community and the, the show's fans. Turns out they're a little busy. You know, uh, you know, Michael's in the middle of shooting his third or fourth film for the year right now. He's working on a project called Just Mercy. 
which is a historical drama that your people should check out. It's got an amazing story to it. Uh, but that's what he's working on right now. And, You're uh, so sweet, pumping other people's projects. That's so nice of you. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, again, they've been so generous and flexible with their time. They're like some of the busiest talent in the industry, and they are bending over backwards to record when production needs it. They're being so supportive of the show. Is it's Dakota just... Fanning also an anime fan or an animation fan? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, what, what, what I adore is the fact that it's, uh, you know, the girl from Coraline is uh, now going to be voicing it also. So. Uh, between that, any, any sort of Neil Gaiman connection to the show, I will take. That's amazing. But uh, yeah, no, they've all, all been great. And as far as um, uh, getting Michael to participate in the show, it's because um, production didn't tell us not to ask him. Nice. Yeah, we, uh, it turns out that Michael uh, influenced the, the art, the concept, even before we had been talking about casting. So, uh, you know, for the first year or so, we were working on early concepts for the characters. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to borrow some cycles from some of the artists that were working on Ruby. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, so that in between working on Ruby, they began to help us figure out uh, the, the cast in the world of Genlock. And then eventually we had our art director, Michael Pietro, come on. And one of the first conversations he had uh, when he joined us is like, hey, man, we got to finish locking down Chase. And we talked for hours about the qualities of the character and the look of him, whatever. And by the end of that talk, Michael observed back to me, it's like, hey, man, we've been referencing Michael B. Jordan a lot in this conversation. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Huh, weird. Michael, uh, Michael Pedro, the artist, goes away for a couple of hours. And then uh, the next thing I know is in my messages, I've got this gorgeous digital painting of he had taken the image of Michael B. Jordan, but had gone ahead and put him in a flight suit. Uh, you know, doing the Top Gun walk in front of the jet and the hangar and all. And we looked at the picture, and we were like, yeah, that's Chase. So we finished locking down the design. A couple months later, production asks, all right, who do you want to play these parts? I'm like, how about Michael B. Jordan? And we sent him uh, a script and uh, imagery from the world. And we had done some test animation with an early version of his uh, 3D model. Uh, so we had Julian Chase delivering lines from Creed. And wow. he looked at all that stuff and uh, he reached back out to us and said the answer wasn't a no which in itself was thrilling. And then we just kept talking for like the next six weeks. And by the end of it, on a day that I'm supposed to be writing, I was on deadline, I had to turn in the next script the next day, uh, we got the call saying that, yeah, Michael B. Jordan wants to play Julian Chase. And then I was somehow expected to finish writing that script that day, which did not happen. <laughs> That's how it always works. So like, great, you got it, we need it immediately. <laughs> you, great, you got it, we, we need it right now, immediately. Yeah. That's how it always works, yeah, better, with schedule. finish it, yeah. yeah. Now, what is, Ruby, that team, I mean, not team, the characters are younger. Genlock is skewing a little bit older, right? They're, they're not all teenagers. Yeah, no, uh, the youngest member on the team is uh, Kemi McLeod, who at the time the story starts is 17. And then I'd say the average age range of the cast drifts up into the early 20s. And then there's some other, uh, you got to have some grown-ups somewhere. So there's uh, the folks actually run the military base that they're hanging out on. But um, much like how uh, Ruby... Uh, grew up year by year uh, with its show, uh, with, with its audience, kind of like Harry Potter. Uh, Genlock is starting at about, in, in terms of the kind of people who might get into Genlock, I'd say it's, a, it's kind of the, the people that are into Ruby right now. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to be, you know, doing Genlock Chibi quite anytime soon. <laughs> oh, but, I want uh, a Genlock Chibi. I, I'm sorry, I want everything Chibi. Yeah. That's just me. <laughs> And I'm assuming we're getting another season of Ruby GB as well? Stay tuned. Yeah, stay yeah. tuned on stuff. He's yeah. looking at me like, we're... oh, God, you didn't tell me you were going to ask me that. No, it's OK. We're, we're also just a little busy working on volume six right now. But <laughs> which you can't tell us about, huh? We want more in the future. <laughs> well, we will look forward to everything coming out of Rooster Teeth, because clearly 2019 is going to be a very, very, very busy year. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Do Thank not go us. anywhere. Thank you, because up next, you know that game, Devil May Cry? Yeah. Well, that team is here to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Jackie Jennings with Sci-Fi Wire. If you can't get enough of New York Comic Con, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for news, interviews, cosplay, and so much more. What are you waiting for?